a lot of the SMB investing, real estate, Twitter, like all of that stuff, which I follow and really enjoy and respect everyone that takes part in, um, there is a very heavy vein of you shouldn't work for anybody ever. Yeah. And um, and I think that that has a lot of negative consequences, both in terms of the people that work for those people yep. and the perception of their value as a result of saying that publicly. Couldn't right? agree more. And then um, and just uh, and just understanding, like, what should my aspiration be? Right. Because if you're saying that publicly, then I should as soon as possible jump ship. Right. If you're going to build a great team, you have to value the team. There are lots of reasons that people can get a W-2, as people put it, <laughs> and still be meaningful contributors to a business and still have an ownership mentality. And I would put the onus on individual owners yep. to make sure that the incentives are aligned for them to be able to do that. Emily. Hi. Welcome to the show. Thank you. My most fun moment at Capital Camp was us talking at dinner I think it was the second night we yeah. talked for like two and a half hours and to be fair at the time i was like i would love to do a podcast <laughs> and you were like i don't do podcasts <laughs> <laughs> i did tell you no i also felt like i kept talking and i kept looking at you like do you want me to shut up and then you were like asking another question oh, yeah. and we just kept going so yeah thanks for i don't know i thought you entertained the nerdiness and well. what came out of that uh i'll preempt was one of the most uh well understood people on business that i'd come across like the the depth and the nuance and just everything you had seen which we're going to talk about a lot of fun we stories can just call today. it nerdiness that's it's nerdiness it <laughs> you're 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 okay being a nerd yeah i am very okay being a nerd okay well then that's a great place to start because i want to know how you got into private equity because i know you were a finance major up on wall street and yeah, you, that's not at all not at all how <laughs> did you all. how did you get into uh Describe just kind of growing up and how you kind of got to permanent equity. Um, okay, so I would say that I've always been one of those kids that wanted to grow up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So I read out of my age range and I was always interested in a variety of different topics. Um, and my dad in particular instilled in me the idea that nobody is off limits. Um, so he had me start corresponding with authors when I was like seven years old, mm -hmm. um, because our, our shared experience was like going to Barnes and Noble and reading books together. Um, and so I started writing to authors. So like one of the creators of Sesame street used to write me typed notes back and I'm sure it was like his assistant or something. But for me, it, it made the idea that you can always reach out to somebody and better understand something feel real even before like the internet was really a thing. Mm. So I always was fairly ambitious, didn't have the idea that there were closed doors. Um, but when it came time for college, I really just optimized for the school that I ended up going to. So I ended up going to University of Missouri. Um, I wanted to go far away, but for financial reasons, that was the right place to go. And, uh, and so I optimized for that school. So the journalism school was one of the best programs in the country. Um, so I initially majored in that and went to the Honors College um, to sort of get to small class sizes in some of the other schools uh, that I had looked at. And so that was kind of the start. And then I ended up missing math. So, <laughs> so again, nerdiness coming out there, um, which is why I started studying econ. Um, and so econ was like my way of making sense of the world in numbers. And then journalism was the ability to sort of communicate that um, and figure out how to... Um, yeah, how to think about how to position things. I ended up going down the strategic communication path at the School of Journalism, which ultimately basically leads into advertising and marketing related careers. Um, and so my first real foray was in publicity. So I worked for the Walt Disney Studios in Burbank and uh, I was in major motion picture publicity. Um, so working on film premieres, working with directors on film launches, um, and it was a very weird, <laughs> weird life. Um, and this was at the dawn of the Great Recession. Yep. So it was a weird time to be doing anything and especially to be starting your career. Um, I had a boyfriend back in Missouri, so I was still looking for reasons that maybe would take me home. And uh, and so the convergence is I was looking around at various publications and I still loved Columbia and I found this article about Brent. <laughs> and the article specifically was about him buying Red One camera technology. 
Um, and so at the time, he owned three companies. He was an entrepreneur uh, and had three marketing and media related companies. One was a research and insights company. One was a commercial production company. And then one was an ad agency. So he had bought the camera technology for the commercial production company. It was a fledgling technology, but I knew about it based on the studios. And so I just reached out to him <laughs> and I found him on LinkedIn. So I think there were probably 50,000 people on LinkedIn in 2009 and, you know, great time to be looking for, for a job. Yeah. And I was like, Hey, what are you doing? Um, I think it, you know, it sounds interesting. And, uh, to his credit, he replied and we had kind of a two to three day exchange on LinkedIn. And then he said, come visit and let's sit down and chat. And then he grilled me for four hours. <laughs> and uh, and uh, as a result of that, um, did offer me a job. It wasn't looking for anyone at that point in time, but we ended up sort of nailing the idea that he could benefit from having a digital division within the company. And uh, they were primarily media placement strategy and then the commercial production at that point. So I came on to hire developers and to figure out you know, a PPC strategy and a bunch of other things for clients. And that same year is when we did the media cross acquisition. Um, and so that really was kind of what led down the path. Um, and it took a few years. I mostly worked on the existing holdings and some of the other activities that we were doing entrepreneurial in entrepreneurial fashion at the time um, up until 2011 and then began to focus on investing at that point. Were you involved in the acquisition of media cross, like how you diligenced it and bought it? Or did Brent just come in and he was like, Hey, we're buying this company and you're going to work on it. Yeah. Um, so I primarily got the, you work on what we have and I'm going to go try and figure this out message. Um, and so at the time we had done some other things, um, and had acquired a small SEO PPC agency. And so we had various other activities going on and MediaCross was in St. Louis. <laughs> and so a part of it was, um, and I think Brent's, Brent said this pretty much publicly, like uh, there wasn't a ton of diligence before we closed the deal. So part of the first like six to nine months was him driving back and forth every yeah. week, trying to figure out what exactly we he thought. had bought. <laughs> and, uh, and so that was a bit of a process. But over time, we began to look for opportunities where those firms could work together. Um, and then what ultimately Media Cross was going to represent going forward. Um, and then what that meant for some of the other activities that we were doing at the time. So it was it was one of those things like Media Cross is very much the story that I tell people as the foundation of why we focus on what we do. Um, because it was one of those things where we had a bunch of like fun ideas. We were trying a bunch of stuff during that period um, as entrepreneurs, as operators. Media Cross was the first time across all of those, all of that activity that we felt like we had done something that felt strategic, intentional, and repeatable. Mm. And so the combination of those things was what ultimately culminated about two years later in us saying, we should look for more situations like that because we think we can actually be of service um, and ultimately, in that case, right, you had a founder who was looking to retire, um, but you had a team who wanted to carry forward. And I'm particularly proud of the fact that the CEO of that business is the is a woman who was there prior to our involvement and continues to lead the business now. And we've owned that business for 15 years. Was there anything you kind of said uh, buying that business? It was uh, I think you said we could repeat it. We could continue to do it. I don't think the first couple of days probably felt that way. Like, <laughs> no. is there something that happened? Was it financial results? Was it a moment? Was it a series of moments where then you said, yeah, this is repeatable? Like what happened to cause you to think that way? So within that team, you had a variety of different people who all had ideas about how to grow the business. But based on the previous owner's lifestyle, it had become a lifestyle optimized business. Mm -hmm. And we see this a lot, right? He was older. Um, the business had gone in a direction that wasn't particularly aligned with his personal passions. And so he was basically just keeping it on the rails um, and making sure that they were providing for the contracts that they ultimately were supposed to be providing for largely for the government. So, you know, kind of long term, just cranking away at stuff. So not super exciting for somebody who got into the industry based on like fine art interest. 
So in that way, part of it was like listening to the employees and trying to figure out what they thought was broken or or in need of improvement within the team. Um, part of it was some reorganization. And then from an outsider perspective, it was identifying that they had skill sets that were marketable to other customer bases. But again, because it had been a lifestyle-oriented business, they had basically just focused on the existing relationships. Um, And so even just putting a couple of business development efforts into practice um, was influential in how they could continue to grow, reinvesting back into improving their website and actually marketing themselves and sort of like solving the cobbler's son has no shoes issue. And, you know, it's, it's kind of basic stuff. It wasn't rocket science, which is part of why it felt repeatable. If it would have been, we found some crazy nugget in what they did. Um, but that wasn't the case at all. Um, and the people there were passionate about the brand, about their clients. They wanted to do more and do better for them. And it was just really providing for the capacity for them to be able to do that. And to be f- and to just for clarity, when y'all bought the business, was the idea to optimize the business and make it better as owners? Or was there another uh, <laughs> strategy you were trying to pursue the day you closed? Uh, you know, I think that um, the way that the business was introduced to Brent, it was you all do marketing in Columbia. They do marketing in St. Louis. Maybe this increases your footprint of doing marketing. Got it. Right. So it was geographic expansion on an operational level at some at some point. Um, but really, like once we got involved, it turns out that they did nothing like what we did, right? So we did project-based or agency of record-based work um, for brands in a variety of different categories. What they do and still do today is primarily government services related work, recruiting physicians and nurses into the National Institutes of Health and branches of the military. That was the core of the business. And they did that on three to seven year contracts. So they're a GovCon, like they're not <laughs> it. But what we ultimately were able to figure out is they don't have to be just that, right? Yeah. Because they have expertise in recruiting in a DOD oriented environment that most marketing firms can't say that they have. And on the standpoint of they understand the military person better than almost anyone in the marketing space. And so that's what they ultimately leverage. So now they serve higher ed institutions and corporate clients who are looking to recruit active military and veterans into um, into roles that they need filled. So it ultimately was one of those things where, again, it was just trying to figure out like what you actually had and how to reorganize it in a way that allowed for them to do more. Okay. So we buy this business and now we have decided this is repeatable. This Maybe is a long journey if we're going to go through. <laughs> we're not going to go. We'll, we'll, we'll get to the meat. I have, a, I have something big in my notes, but <laughs> this is something we talked about as we've been sitting here for the last hour before we press record. Um, you decided it was something you wanted to do. And then you described this period where for a few months, you didn't really know what you were going to do anymore. Right. right. And Brent kind of told you, Go Why don't you it figure it out? Mm-hmm. And then you guys came to the conclusion, like maybe your job should be to go start looking for businesses to buy. Mm-hmm. How old were you? <laughs> I was 23. Classic brand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was one of those situations where, um, so again, we had a lot of entrepreneurial activity going on. And what you and I talked about is I am I have a pretty strong risk aversion. And the reason why I love working on the segment of the market that we do is because these are businesses that have already been successful and you're trying to figure out operationally how they can improve and why it's sustainable over time. At that point in our careers, we were doing a lot of things that weren't yet at scale. Mm -hmm. Um, And in some cases, we're still operating in the red. You're trying to figure out, you know, product market fit. You're trying to find your customers, all of those things. Um, Just based on personal experience and my risk tolerance, I basically figured out that I become a mobile in in that type of environment it is not for me. Um, and so with that, I volunteered that, hey, I'm not I'm not particularly good at this. Um, and it's making me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> and uh, and so there was a conversation of like, okay, yeah, go do some research and figure out what you want to do. Do you want to start something else? Do you want to go work on Media Cross? Like what do you want to do? And Um, And so uh, for about four months, I just came into the office every day and just did a whole bunch of like reading and thinking about stuff. And 
I, I, to this day, don't know why he gave me that grace, but, <laughs> but it was a good period of trying to figure out, you know, I think he was in the midst of trying to figure out exactly how he wanted to optimize the firm moving forward. Um, and I think we both knew, like we enjoyed working together. Um, there were talents that were useful, but we just didn't know exactly how they all came together. Um, and so ultimately led to a conversation of sitting down and saying, okay, I think that we're going to focus, um, which was his decision to make on behalf of the firm as the, as the owner, um, and then figure out, you know, what that meant in based on my talents and skill sets. And he's like, I think you should just go look for businesses. So, um, that's what I did. (laughs) And, uh, and for the first few years, I mean, this is like 2011, 2012. Um, the lower middle market is still very fragmented, Mm -hmm. but back then it was like basically the wild west. Like we would have all (laughs) kinds of like misrepresented financials, people who like could barely speak English trying to sell us companies. We looked at stuff that we would never look at today just based on the dynamics or the value proposition. It was a whole, it was a whole variety of experiences, um, and a lot of, you know, just navigating the market. Um, and we ultimately didn't do a deer, a deal for like three and a half years. So it was a lot of hunting. What did you learn over those three and a half years? Cause I think, I think maybe the question I'm really trying to ask is most people think about buying businesses. They need to go get a fancy degree. They need to work on wall street. Yeah. They gotta be at big private equity. Oh, and you were a journalism econ <laughs> major at 23 well, so years old. I think, I mean, uh, not to discount journalism because I do think that it gives you a for very sure. specific skill set, right? in how to ask questions and how to think about um, a holistic story that you're trying to put together around any topic. Yeah. Um, And that's ultimately the skill set that I think I honed while I was doing that. And then the econ side of it was really trying to figure out, you know, how to interpret the opportunity within a company and its ability to scale and its ability to maintain a position in the market. So I think my education did inform what I ultimately ended up doing. But I had plenty of people who told me, you need to go back to B-School. Yeah. You need to go do like the normal track. Um, and it's one of my like particular versions when it comes to talking specifically to young women about their career tracks is yeah. if you go for something predictable, you're not going to get an outsized result. Um, and, uh, and I talked about with Brent and with other people at our firm multiple times of like, hey, do you like, should I bounce? Should I go? And it was always like, we have a ton of stuff going on. You know, how could you learn at a have faster pace or in a more substantive way than just by being in the middle of the work? And um, and I think that was true, right? So my big belief is like reps matter. You just need to have reps. Yep. And um, specifically looking at smaller companies, um, every company is its own story and its own sort of opportunity set. And you while there are patterns and there are certain ways of asking questions to try and figure out exactly what something represents, no one is like the other. Um, And so you just need a volume to be able to appreciate, you know, which is the one that you actually want to take a bet on invest in. All right. I think, and, and, and we're, uh, we're moving along nicely. I promise you we're not going to go year by year, (laughs) but I think this is an important, this is important. You all bought a business realized it worked and then for three and a half years did not another deal which if yes, and from brent paid my salary for three and a half, half years, years to do that yeah but i would imagine and again this is just what you see and this is why y'all are unique and i think have built the reputation you have in most companies it's like we got to get a deal done this year our goal this year is yeah. x amount of deals yeah was it this conscious yeah, decision the based optimization has never been our our focus but I think that um, what what is actually even more ironic than that, and I don't know if we've talked about this, is the deal we ultimately did next, we first saw in 2012. Okay. So as you can imagine, you, <clears throat> so- What business was that? Presidential pools. Oh, yeah. So as you, so <laughs> it was it was a really great time to get started, but it was a fairly volatile time yeah. in that it's post Great Recession, right? So companies are doing a wide variety of things in terms of performance and velocity and reorganization and like new market dynamics. We're on the very front end of what ended up being a 10 year bull run, but nobody knew that at the time. right? So at that point in time, we're just sitting there going, "Okay, so what do you do? So presidential didn't do well in the Great Recession. Phoenix did not do well generally in the Great Recession. 
And when we saw the business in 2012, they were on a recovery path. Um, and uh, to giving credit to the original owner, he had bought it back. He had actually sold it in 2006 and then bought it back during the recession. And he had begun to take what was a fairly asset-heavy model and make it a more asset-light model um, and something that could scale up and down with market dynamics more easily. Ultimately, didn't really need to do that because it continued to scale up from that point forward, but it established optionality. So when we saw it in 2012, we were like, okay, this is really interesting, but we don't know where all of this stuff is going to go. You have you know, grand ambition in terms of your pro- projections and whatnot. So we'd like to stay in touch and see where things end up. So we see it the next year, kept in touch, um, and he ultimately had achieved his his uh, projections, which was impressive, but then his expectations had gone up. And then we were like, okay, well, <laughs> maybe we're still interested, but we want to see this uh, to see if this is sort of like a one-time performance hit with the intent to sell again, or if this is sustainable growth. Um, and he had ambitions. He was second in the market. He wanted to be first. So then you keep going and he thought he had a deal with somebody else. um, And he let us know, like, I think I'm going down this path. And we said, Godspeed, like, you know, we're really happy for you. If you think that's the right solution, we're rooting for you, regardless of whether we end up partnering. Um, But we continued to just check in because there were some really interesting attributes to the business and uh, we liked it. (laughs) And so, (laughs) and then when we would be in Phoenix, we would stop by and say hello and Anyways, it ultimately came to a very quick conclusion in 2015 when he called and said, you know, ultimately didn't work out with the buyer. I think I'm ready. Can we do this? And um, and there was negotiation at that point to try and get to a middle ground. Um, but at that point, we had three years of them performing as they said they would um, and us forming a relationship with Trust Embedded obviously diligence is a shit show regardless. So <laughs> it was nice to have had that build up time to be able to do what ultimately was a much bigger deal than the media cross deal, right? Um, and we were still ill-equipped like from a literacy standpoint and how to do deals when we did that deal. Um, but because we had that rapport built up over those years, it ultimately worked out really well. So for me, it's like it was three and a half years of no outcome, um, but it w- didn't mean three and a half years of no work. Um, And I think that we ultimately were able to hone our taste, right, in deals, um, situations that we were definitely averse to, and then uh, appreciate sort of what people were capable of doing, especially on the back of the recession and what that trajectory of a business is going to look like over that next period. I give a lot of credit to you and to Brent. It seems like a three, you could almost look at three and a half years as maybe, I don't know, like a a, a miss or like, oh, for go, sure. <laughs> like, how do you know if you're successful when you're working for three and a I half mean, years and you're not getting a deal done? Of that, right? Like, of just like, are we growing fast enough? Yeah. Like, are we doing this well? We see other people have entered the market much later than us. I mean, we saw all the HVAC deals in like 2011, 2012, and 2013 yeah. when they were trading for like two times earnings. Yeah. And now we see people buying them for like 18, 19 times. And we're like, what did, what, <laughs> what were happened? we doing? <laughs> right. Um, but uh, at the same time, like I, I think that um, we do very much think about, you know, you only have a finite number of resources yeah. in terms of your time and your energy. And, um, and in the case that like, we think there are a lot of ways that companies can win. Um, We have a very specific style in how we can be supportive of companies in a certain path of winning. Um, And if they want to go down a different path, we're totally okay with that. And we support them in that. And vice versa, if someone partners with us, we want to be fully committed. We don't want to be partially committed. We don't want to be stretched thin. We want to be prepared, equipped, and actually partner in a meaningful way. Okay. You said it took three years and then you said he called you and he said, I'm ready. And so one of the, uh, I have in, in all caps, and I think this is the theme of the rest of the podcast. So if this interests you, you're going to love the next <laughs> hour, hour and a half. How do we make an investment um, and what all goes into it? And we're going to talk about diligence. We're okay. talking about Alaska. We're going to talk <laughs> about how to diligence geographies and industries. But I think the first place to start how do you know a seller's ready? Because you can burn a lot of time in this world thinking you're about to buy this business all yeah. to get to the end 
in what for most of the businesses I imagine you're buying, founder led, family owned, owned a long time. Yep. Maybe it even sat, maybe they were committed when it started. And by the end, they're like, this is my identity is in this. Yep. How have you all gotten comfortable with like, we think this business really is ready to sell? Oh, well, I think there are a variety of different ways to answer this question. So first off, I think the um, expected answer most of the time is that you have proprietary deal flow that you can control the process with. And I think that's utter bullshit. <laughs> so um, we have had we have had plenty of situations where people have come to us and they have said, you know, we would like to get to know you. We may be interested in doing something um, there. There is certainly value in having direct communication and trying to figure out a path forward. But sometimes people go fishing. And and a lot of times when people reach out to us directly, they're going fishing, right? Like they're trying to figure out, is this the right time? Am I actually interested in doing this? What does it look like? We are happy to have that conversation, but we fully acknowledge that it is fishing. That is not commitment. You have not made a financial commitment to anybody to do anything. Um, and emotionally, most of the time, you know, if you're reaching out directly, it may mean that you haven't really involved anyone else in your life, which is different than like confidentially doing a deal and is more about like controlling whether or not you're committed to doing something. Yeah. Right. So we we take that at its face value. We're happy to have the conversation. We're happy to start forming a relationship, but we do not assume that you are ready to sell. Right. Um being ready to sell, I think, is a path for people. Um, and I think most sellers, when they first start talking to buyers, don't know if they're ready to sell. Um, and sometimes people get excited about the money and still emotionally are not ready to sell, right? Um, and so for us, it is a series of events mm. and and sort of pattern recognition along the way. So to give you like specific examples, if we are talking to an advisor first about an opportunity, um, we want to understand how long they've known the seller um, and the context under which that relationship developed. And then we're trying to understand um, who's making decisions. So sometimes it is, you know, the majority shareholder, but sometimes it's not. Yep. And trying to understand why that may or may not be the case and what the driving force of, of the transaction is, which you can suss out in a couple different ways. We end up asking questions around you know, the transaction priorities, but also sort of like life circumstance, who makes decisions, who's involved in day to day, like really trying to make sure that all the pattern matching actually puts together a cohesive story. So I can't tell you how many times, especially kind of 2021 <laughs> to 2022, there were situations where, you know, it's like the business has reached a certain scale, they're ready for the next level, whatever that is. And um, and then you find out that the owner is like 38 yeah. <laughs> and, and they want to sell out. And you're like, I don't that doesn't that doesn't compute for me. Like, if this is a great opportunity, why does a 38 year old 38 year old one out? And there may be an extenuating circumstance, but we do need to understand what that is. Otherwise, we are not committed to moving forward on that deal. Yep. So it's always situationally context first. Um, and then once we start talking to a seller directly, it really is about how they talk about the business. So, you know, there's the cliche like I versus we type stuff. Um, and then there's how the business has developed over time, who owns relationships and how they think about, um, you know, sort of judgment within the company. If they are still very much a key man risk within the organization, that leads very naturally into a conversation of, okay, what do you think that means in, in terms of our ability to partner in the business, especially in a majority capacity? What happens if you lose interest when you get that check, right? What happens if you, if your you know, spouse is telling you to take steps back? What does that mean for us if we're going to move forward? And so it leads to a conversation that's less about like, are you committed or not committed? And more about an appreciation for what the transition is going to ultimately have to look like which usually means, you know, working at least as hard, sometimes more, not less for some period of time to make sure that the institutional knowledge that lives within that person gets transferred into the business. Um, and walking through that with them, and this is like pre IOI, this is pre like even talking about valuation, helps them to appreciate what we're trying to do, right? Which is to steward a business, right? To steward their team. And they start, a lot of people, especially like on an owner level, underappreciate their own value. And so you start to highlight that for them and say, these are meaningful things we're going to have to solve for in order for you to be able to take those steps back. 
So we get through that. And then we are also pattern matching to um, based on how they answer those questions, but also how they answer follow-ups. So we typically don't like ask quantitative questions when we're having our first phone call with an operator because we want to stay focused on what makes it a great business and like, how do you guys make decisions? How do you think? And, um, and so then, you know, if we have questions about specific customers or suppliers or, or financial questions, we'll follow that up. If we get any inkling of a response, that's basically like, I want to know value first, and I'm not willing to have you holistically appreciate the nuances of the business before you designate a value to me, then we're pretty much at. And the reason why is it basically says like, I'm fishing, right, to us. It says, I'm not willing to commit to you. I'm not willing to try to build trust in your direction, but I want to know what you're going to do for me. Um, And so for us, that just has never created a scenario that we've been successful in closing. So today we just avoid it if that's the path it's going down. Can you just dive, just go a, a layer deeper, I versus we? When, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So, um, so you talk about like how a business has been built and depending on who the owner is and how they think about the business, um, you know, a lot of them were founders and a lot of them were key decision makers for a very long period and may still be. Um, but when you start to talk about daily operations, if every answer begins with, I do this and they do this. Mm. It's it's effectively what you would consider a silo if you were talking about any two teams. But the issue is, in this case, excuse me, in this case, the owner has the skin in the game and no one else does. Mm. So whatever the answer is, I do this. If it's consequential to risk management, to estimation, to pricing, to customer relationships, to how you recruit key talent, how you manage the team, it's a problem. Yep. Like it's a problem from a transition standpoint if you're looking to leave. If you're not looking to leave, it's a whole different conversation of what do effective partnership dynamics look like, right? Um, and you had Mark on, like Mark is the the goat in terms of trying to work with people on a, in a coaching capacity who may have been um, some combination of an individual contributor and the leader of their own company and trying to help them appreciate how to scale themselves and therefore scale the company. So when we can partner, that's great, but we have to know that the person has the attitude that they want that coaching. This is a good time uh, also. I probably should have done this at the beginning. Can you clarify what you do? <laughs> we know you started finding businesses, but now yeah. this is this is 10 years later. Yeah, so I'm responsible for uh, essentially the front end of our firm. Okay. So I'm responsible for marketing, origination, and the deal process. Okay. Um, so that means that I'm typically the person that advisors with a meaningful opportunity are going to talk to. I'm the person who talks to owners first um, and tries to assess whether or not we can be a good fit for the business. Um, I make the first offer. And then if we're moving forward on that, I negotiate what you would consider to be key terms, right? So enterprise value, how much are we buying um, and uh, what the consideration set will be, how how the money is delivered. Um, and then Taylor takes over into diligence. Tim makes fund-oriented decisions. And then Mark and his team lead post-close operations. Okay. I think that's just important for context. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and maybe it's the only way we've been able to scale the way that we have is to think about it in that way and in sequence and sort of, yeah, it's a sequence based approach, but it allows people to stay focused on what they're best at. Like I should really not manage, um, you know, teams yeah. <laughs> I've done it. I've, I've, I've done it over my career, but you know, in the same way I had the conversation about, uh, operating in the red, not being great for me. Like there, I learned a lot and I think I got better for it, but I will never be on Mark's level and I'm okay with that. Yep. You are what Mark is, calls a principal. Um, okay, and, and I don't even know. I just jumped to assumption that understanding if it's actually a willful seller might be the first thing you need to be interested. I, I guess the question is, when do you know this is something we're going to dig into a little bit? I, I wish that I could quantify that for you. I think that it's a combination of things. So I, I definitely have taste on what, I like to see in the value proposition of a business. So how long it's been around, who they serve, what their positioning is within the market, how they price and how money moves through the organization are all kind of key areas on a company attributes level that I that I try in somewhere in my head. I'm just like, 
making that puzzle, right? Mm-hmm. And then separately is the competitive competitiveness question. So is this a company that we should be the steward of? Um, and how should we think about that? Because there, you know, people have a lot of options. They have the option to do nothing. They have the option to sell to a strategic and lose their identity. They have the option to sell to an ESOP and sell to the employees. They have an option to sell to traditional private equity, right? We are none of those things. Um, but to the extent that those are all options and we acknowledge that people should go explore those and appreciate them for what they are and then figure out what serves them. But we also need to form an opinion on whether or not we can be helpful. Um, and there are certain situations where we can be more or less helpful, especially considering um, what their vision from a positioning of the company is on a go forward basis. So what I mean by that is, so to take a, a, a concrete example, um, food and beverage for us, most of the time is a quick no. Okay. Because. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's a bummer for me too. We have seen a few um, sort of specialty foods that we have looked at pretty closely, but most food companies are structured and set up to eventually be sold to a major corporation. So everything about them is trying to achieve a certain scale, not necessarily a certain economic model in that process in order to be attractive enough to be bought by a major corporation. And the entire industry feeds that, right? Based on like buying shelf space at grocery stores. Like it's all, you know, kind of based on that. Everybody wants the niche brands, but those niche brands are going to have the power of major corporations behind them in order to achieve that scale. So when we see that, it's a question of like, why don't they want that? right? If we're going to move forward, why do you not want to go down that path? And sometimes there's an incredibly intriguing situation, um, a a desire for independence, a differentiated market that they serve, um, an unwillingness from a a corporate standpoint to engage in the type of activity, excuse me, for for a variety of reasons. Um, You can kind of go down the path of like, there are exceptions to the rule, but on average, when we see that the the ultimate goal for them is to get to scale. And the way that they do that is primarily by reinvesting heavily into manufacturing capacity and into product extension and inventory and shelf space with the intention of getting in the attention of a corporation. It's not a good fit for us, right? Got it. Yep. Um, oil and gas is not a good fit for us because somebody in Texas passed on it before we ever saw it, <laughs> right? And so we want to acknowledge that like we probably are not in a position to better understand the opportunity that exists there. Um, And there are lots of specialists who probably didn't appreciate it either. Um, And there's probably a reason for that. So, you know, kind of having some sort of circle of competence, hubris, like we try to avoid the hubris and try and say, okay, we're just going to stay within our lane. Um, But, and, and the same thing is true, right? So we partnered on a software business last year. None of us write code, none of us. Um, and so my first conversation with them was, Hey guys, like, what do you want help with? Cause if you want help with writing code, like we can't be helpful. So the conversation was then about, that's not what we want help with, right? We want help with scaling how we approach major organizations, how we think about the structural hierarchy of our organization, how we establish incentive plans that keep people that we train here, like all of that stuff, right? It's the more detailed nuanced, like, how do you scale? Um, strategy that they wanted help with. And and immediately we were like, well, we can be helpful with that. So it just depends on what people are trying to solve for. And that does that answer the question of should we be the steward of this business? I know that's probably not like an easy, that's probably a mix. You can answer that different ways, but how do you know, like, yeah, we should be the steward of this? Yeah, I think that um, where, where I mostly get on that question Um, And that becomes sort of a conflicting conversation in my head is if the opportunity feels like it's going to last for decades or not. Um, And so durability really matters. Pricing position really matters. And then um, sort of specialization of the operator matters. So like some businesses are managed by engineers, like actual accredited engineers. And so no one from our firm could step in and operate the day to day of that business in the same way that they could. So if you think about that, then you need redundancy to solve for that issue if you're going to be able to steward it for a long time, or it shouldn't be something that we can be helpful on. They need to go find somebody who has similar credentials and similar capabilities in that way. Just on a guess, how many businesses do you see before you're at least 
to a maybe we should steward this. We're kind of interested. <laughs> um, so I mm, I'm about to tee up a question. I'm just teeing up a question. I have I probably see a couple thousand deals a year uh, at varying stages of like teaser through um, or somebody sending me an email. And we have made, um, I think we have put sort of structural valuations around uh, 16 deals this year. Sidebar question. This isn't what I was going to ask, but I think it's interesting. Um, how many times, and maybe the answer is zero, do, does a seller approach you maybe with that mentality of like, all I care about is price. Mm -hmm. But after meeting y'all, you show them it's why I want to talk to sellers really quickly. Yep. So advisors um, have their own incentive structure. Uh, most of them are incentivized mostly to close a deal for the highest possible price because they get paid More. on a percentage of the deal value. So for them, um, we look not as attractive in a lot of cases for a lot of reasons. We have no financial contingencies and we have a very strong record of closing deals we go under LOI on. But for them, they want to chase out what they consider to be like the golden goose. If I have one good egg, I'm going to try and make sure that I get the highest possible price for it because I'm putting in the work either way. So uh, in that, we want direct access to the owner as early as we can possibly get it to try and make sure and 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 really to understand whether or not they have that understanding right around like, OK, so you are you trying to optimize for enterprise value? Are you trying to optimize for cash at close? Are you trying to optimize for your quickest exit? Are you trying to optimize for whatever it may be, right? Like just saying like, I want top dollar doesn't actually mean anything because there's still nuance to what that means at the end of the day. But do they ever change what they're optimizing for after meeting y'all? Yes. Being like, oh my gosh, this is, I never thought I could look at my business this way. Yes. So it's, the answer is you can, not necessarily you're trying to change people's minds, but they might have a conversation. Y'all, maybe they don't, you don't hear from, but they call back and they go, man, y'all said some things that nobody's ever told well, me. Well, they just don't appreciate that that option exists in the market yep. for them, right? A lot of times it doesn't feel like it exists when you're looking at um, a wide swath of what feel like incredibly spreadsheet oriented financial buyers. So if you can get away from that, then you start to talk about other operational considerations and once they realize that they can articulate priorities in that arena and have people listen to them, it does change the way that they think about the opportunity set. It doesn't mean we win every time because there is kind of a, um, uh, I, I think about it in terms of like, we don't want seller's remorse. So it's it's protecting us as well, especially because we partner so often. But I don't want someone to uh, do a deal with us that had a deal that was like double the value that they didn't fully evaluate yep. because that will constantly be in the back of their head. For right? sure. So when we have conversations with people, we're typically not the highest bidder, but we're typically competitive. Right. And then we talk about the nuance and the people we do best with are people who have what I refer to as engineering oriented mindsets in the sense that they care about the details. They care about where the money comes from. They care about it's the behavior of it is the way we frame it, yep. um, how long it's available, how it treats the company, how decisions are made, like all of the dominoes that come from how you are capitalized. <laughs> and so if they appreciate all of that nuance, then we tend to do pretty well, yep. at least in being a very competitive option for them. And then it comes down to sort of like, what are the deltas, right? And our experience is that when you have deltas that are more than like 20, 25%, then our encouragement is like, go chase it out and see if it's real. Because sometimes it's real, but a lot of times it's not real. Um, and a lot of times it's a uh, a position to move forward, to get something under LOI, to lock it up for 90 to 120 days and to then figure out what I'm going to pay for the business, right? Yep. Um, and that can be, uh, that disillusionment for a seller um, causes de deal fatigue, right? Um, but we would rather them get that in the real world with other people as opposed to us trying to educate them in the abstract and then, you know, risking them having seller's remorse later. And one thing we talked about that really stood out that night at dinner was you look at a lot of maybe your job, the team's job early on is like, we're just question askers. We're not making any promises. Correct. We're not throwing out numbers Correct. like we are asking questions. Yep. Does that differ from a lot of other buyers? Are they are, are do a lot of other buyers start promising right out the gate? I mean, I think 
I have friends in traditional private equity yeah. and they will throw around multiples a lot more commonly than we do and they mean it. So what what I mean by that, it's not actually a bad way of operating. It's more prescriptive though. So they have specific ways that they underwrite and approach different types of opportunity. So if you have a SaaS deal, we are willing to buy 75% at this multiple range, depending on if your ARR is this, this, or this. Mm. That's what they do. Yep. And so it's like, it's the spreadsheet talking and telling you what they will pay. Yep. And they already have like the banks lined up to provide leverage in accordance with that model. Yep. Um, we don't have a standard model yep. that exists for any deal. We want to understand who's selling, why they're selling, how they think about the future, what they want to benefit from in the future. We want to understand everything about the business and how cash moves through the business. We value businesses based on its cash flow, um, not based on like EBITDA or some other number. What's the distinction? So, uh, so from the standpoint of discretionary cash flow is what you can buy beer with if you're an owner. Okay. What's EBITDA? <laughs> so, <laughs> EBITDA is uh, something made up by accountants. Um, so what what we mean by it though, uh, you know, it used to be that the rough calculation was EBITDA less capital expenditures. Honestly, in the last two years, it's mostly been working capital adjustments in addition to capex that have made a, a real change. Um, and so anything that was operating in just-in-time inventory over the last, you know, kind of 10 years has made a material change in how the business is structured. Um, and it's generally meant that part of the earnings for the year is being reinvested back into growing the inventory level in a pretty meaningful way. So then it's a question of, okay, is that sustainable now? Is it going to continue to grow on pace with growth in the company? Go down the line of trying to figure out what free cash flow actually looks like. Why is working capital always the thing that people <laughs> fight over? Like no matter who, um, whether it's reading y'all's or other podcasts or yeah. listening, it's like working capital is where everybody decides to disagree. Well, because I think that uh, an owner often feels that it's stored value. That they. What do you mean by that? Uh, they, it's the money that they could have taken out, but instead left in the business, okay. right? So they think about it as stored value, and and it's totally, I totally appreciate that. But then the other side of the coin is if you take all of that out, what is the business capable of, right? Yep. So uh, it's, we, the metaphor we use is like it's a body without blood. You can't, you can't do anything with it and it won't perform <laughs> based on the historic value if it doesn't have what it had before. Okay. Um, and so it is, it, it is sometimes a conversation, right? So like working capital also moves a lot. So the seasonality of buildups of inventory, of cash, what they do with cash at the end of the year, how they think about securities. Like some people manage their personal family securities on their balance sheet. So trying to figure out if that is there for any business purpose or if it truly is personal, those are all conversations that lead to a lot of nuance. Um, and we've gotten to a place where, you know, we don't make that decision upfront. That is very much a conversation and we try to do so with an appreciation for what the business needs and um, and how to think about positioning it so that post-close, it never feels the effect of a transaction. Right. Okay. In the vein of asking questions, I think this is a, a good time. We'll probably pick two stories. Okay. But one that I vividly remember just being fascinated was, y'all were going to buy a business in Alaska. Yes. And... When I started realizing, oh my gosh, the chops that you had are off the charts was as you started describing to me the questions you asked to understand whether you would or wouldn't buy that business. Yes. So let's talk about the questions really. How would somebody underwrite businesses in Alaska? <laughs> what are things that stood okay. out to you? Um, <laughs> so I, I think this is part of like hunting where other people aren't hunting okay. is part of uh it, is part of what I'm naturally drawn to. Okay. So the deals that get circulated to every private equity firm, I'm not as interested in, right? We don't participate in broad auctions. Um, we wanna get to know sellers and broad auctions don't provide for that. So uh, part of looking for things in, in, you know, kind of untapped hunting grounds means that we have looked in some pretty exotic locations. So we've looked in Hawaii, we looked, we looked in Guam, we looked in Alaska. And I, I started getting to know advisors in Alaska years ago just saying, like, if you ever have anything that's of enough scale, because there's only like 730,000 people in the whole state. So uh, it has to be kind of a weirdly based economic value proposition. Um, but if you have something that you think should be stewarded long term, like 
we are not worried about the geography. We can and will support a really good opportunity, even if it's based up there. So got finally got a really good call about uh, an opportunity. And I can't tell you exactly what it is, yeah. but to the extent that it's a consumer facing company. Um, an and, igloo builder. <laughs> exactly. Um, and it served, it served the state. So they had multiple locations. Um, and so there was the opportunity to understand the dynamics throughout the state that helps support the value proposition. Um, so <laughs> I think the funny part of the story is, um, you know, uh, in the abstract, it sounds very exciting. It was more exciting when we went up there <laughs> and like, met, met the guy. Um, and I think this is probably the best way to tell it. So we were asking questions, trying to understand why uh, this business could continue to scale and how it had scaled over time. And uh, the nuances of that right within businesses, especially amidst COVID, is understanding supply chain. Like supply chain to Alaska is way more complex than supply chain to the lower 48 labor. Um, and why you have people spending on this particular category. So the the crazy part was, so we go up there, meet the guy for the first time. He had just come back from trapping because it, when you're in Alaska, that's a ac daily activity for you. <laughs> I had never seen a Wolverine in my entire life and he had three uh, in the back of his truck. And so that was fun. We got to talking about that. And that's my thing is like, I don't like to flirt with people about their business. I like to nerd out with people. I like to understand like, why did you get into this? What were you passionate about? And how did that ultimately lead into an entrepreneurial opportunity that became profitable, right? Yep. For him, his story was fascinating and it gave me an appreciation for Alaskan history that I didn't have. So his family was one of the families that during um, FDR's administration was relocated from Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan were kind of the three states um, that had become food scarce. And so they were relocating people under like a New Deal pioneer program to Alaska. They set aside $5 million dollars and 200,000 acres or something like that for these people to go up there and to take like a 40 acre plus plot. They could buy more acres, but everybody was given 40 and develop an agricultural farm. And uh, this was, you know, kind of like first part of the 20th century. There's very little infrastructure up there. They had had kind of the gold boom, but still not a lot. It's not a state, right? Like it's all these crazy things. It's a frontier. And people go up there. So his family was one of the families that went up there. Apparently, like 20 years into that program, there were only a few families left and they were one of them. So his family was one of those families that like went through the harsh winters, lived in tents, and then started to build a house like during the summer while farming their own land. And that was like his entrepreneurial bone. I'm like, okay, well, you're capable of anything. Yeah. <laughs> and now you lay in planes <laughs> on the side of mountains to go trapping for wolverines. So cool. Um, but in that, we started talking about, you know, kind of the nuances of operating in Alaska and what the Alaskan opportunity set looks like. So uh, the big revelation for me was an appreciation of the Alaska Permanent Fund. Um, which was established in the 1970s on the backs of them finding oil. And, uh, it, you know, it's it's an interesting investment study if people are, are nerdy in that way. But on a consumer level, it provides a stipend to any qualifying citizen of the state of Alaska. It is essentially a sovereign fund on an annual basis. So every year, every person gets a check. So their labor pool at this company um, was uh, partially made up of American Samoans, which had immigrated from Hawaii up to Alaska as part of another like migration effort to populate the state. So with that, um, apparently Samoans on average have much larger families because they um, it's just culturally appropriate for them. And so they'll have like eight to 12 children. Mm -hmm. So when you get a check, so like last year, the check was like $3,200 per person. I remember, yeah. <laughs> They're getting like $25,000 checks from the state. And it creates a huge discretionary surplus of consumer spending within the state. 
So there are these nonsensical spikes in spending in consumer-facing companies in Alaska that are based on when those payments are made, Mm -hmm. which is crazy and something that you can't anticipate from the lower 48, right? So you start to look for those nuances. So the issue for them was American Samoans were largely their labor force. And when they would get these checks, many of them would quit and then come back like a couple months later. And so there was a huge like supply shortage um, on the back end of activity. And so it was kind of this like revenue spikes, but then productivity goes way down and customer service issues rise. And so there are a bunch of like nuances to understand around that. Um, And then you start getting into, okay, so why doesn't a big brand in their category, excuse me, a big brand in their category just come up and establish a presence in the state? So you've got 730,000 people, not that much. In the whole state? In the whole state. Wow. Um, So it doesn't feel that populous. So a lot of people underwrite it that way. But you have a big transient population. At any given time, there's at least 20,000 troops stationed there um, and their families. And so that's the the actual headcount on the military side. And that population, obviously, is highly transient, as is the oil and gas people coming to work on the pipelines there, um, along with other infrastructure spending and related DOD activity. So you get all these people that move out there that are only there for a certain period of time. And they have, you know, spending power as well as permanent states, uh, state residents. And so it creates this like weird um, constant churn. And because it's so far removed from everything else, people don't bring their stuff with them. (laughs) And then you're stuck inside like half the year while it's, you know, a frozen tundra. So you buy more stuff on average, apparently. And you also um, don't bring stuff with you. So people are big spenders within the state. Um, But because you're spending within the state, the supply chain matters. The supply chain is rather nuanced because the supply chain all anchors out of Seattle, but has to go through specific ports throughout Alaska. And so you just get into this like bizarre set of circumstances that allows for differentiated pricing power, low competitive situation, um, And, you know, sort of market dynamics that allow for high consumer loyalty and high spending because, you know, they only have limited options within within the market. So there were lots of reasons that we liked it um, and we were very excited about it. Ultimately, couldn't move forward on the opportunity, um, honestly, because of real estate, of all things. Um, And so it, it was that that ultimately meant that we couldn't move forward. But for me, you know, kind of underwriting the deal. It was thinking about those elements and how they came together to try and figure out if this is something that felt durable or not. Um, and based on the permanent fund, based on activity and DOD spending on that side of um, of the continent, um, there were a lot of reasons why we were pretty bullish on on spending up there. So if anyone has more opportunities in Alaska, we're still looking. Boom. <laughs> Um, okay, let's pick one more example. We could you we have listed enthusiast businesses. We could talk Russia. We could talk <laughs> luxury good price points. Um, or we could talk why I love Texas. Why I love te- uh, why I love Texas. We have, I mean, we have bought several companies in Texas. Texas has been a great um, great opportunity for us for a host of reasons. Like owners down here seem to deeply care about their businesses and deeply care about the people and the families that they employ. So that's always been um, incredibly well aligning in getting to know an opportunity. Also like Texans are, I think, kind of process averse as well um, on average. (laughs) So, So they don't adhere, you know, sometimes like where we don't do as well is when people you know, want to run a strict process. And and we we are not good at that. And um, and if they are closed off to us getting to know each other in that process, um, it ultimately won't lead anywhere. Down here, people are incredibly relational. They want to go grab beers. They want to go, you know, out to dinner really early in the process and get to know each other. Um, and that works out well for us. It turns out like if we spend time with people, we can figure out, you know, whether or not we can be good partners. And that's our preference. Um, so Texas has been awesome. I think uh, in terms of like just talking about businesses that we've enjoyed getting to know, I think the enthusiast one is probably worth like understanding because it explains 
a couple things. Okay. So like if you ask me what my favorite types of businesses are, there are basically two categories. So one is high lifetime value. Okay. And then the other is when you have a product or service that you can sell to multiple people um, and uh, under one sort of like unified effort. And that's a very different definition than saying, I like ARR. <laughs> so um, so um, from my point of view, an enthusiast business um, is high lifetime value. So you have people who, um, who are so passionate about a particular category that they will outsize their spending in association with that category. And your ability to, can, to feed into that can be based on having an installed base with a lot of options. It can be based on high, you know, unique val- value, like limited runs or whatever that may be. Um, and it usually means that the price point is not a primary concern, right? So when you have a tremendous amount of margin, you just have a lot more optionality when it comes to how to scale the business. So ultimately, that's what it feeds into. So I love high lifetime value businesses. How you get to high lifetime value can be in a variety of different ways. Sometimes it can be that it's a one-off, just very high margin purchase. Um, But even if we take like selective search, which is executive matchmaking for love, people are buying 12-month contracts, but some people renew. And some people look at that and say, like, that's a failure. They didn't win. But we look at it and say, okay, if they really enjoyed the process, but ultimately haven't found somebody yet, and they're being patient and want to continue to work with the firm, isn't that the utmost testimony to the firm's value? Like, that's incredible, right? So they have high lifetime value customers, both that only establish one contract, but that can establish, you know, two or three years of contracts as well. So that's kind of one. Um, So high lifetime value can come in a variety of different ways. The other is what you get when you just are a master manipulator of the market. So I looked at a business one time that I, and uh, the frustrating part of my job is I am subject to like NDAs on basically everything I look at. Yeah. So I talk around things, which yeah. can be very frustrating, I'm sure for you. But uh, in this case, this was someone who figured out a way to sell to the government um, a specific product under a long-term contract that as the government finished its use of said product, they could sell into the private market for much higher value based on its utilization, previous utilization. So it's like, it gets better with age. Wow, it's like wine almost. Which is a bizarre thing. Yes, it is like wine. So like where you can arbitrage that, um, which are very unique businesses and not always subject to like power law dynamics, right? Like they can't always be businesses that will get really big, but they're really profitable, very sticky and very interesting because they serve like these sort of specific market propositions that are hard to disrupt, don't have much competition. Um, and you can usually name your price. So to me, it's like it all feeds into the idea that um, you know, if you think about like speed, quality, and price as being the controlling factors, like quality and high price, like for me, are the quadrants that we will always sort of trend towards because it allows for durability in a variety of different market positions. If you're, you know, going for speed, you are going to have to stay on top of technology that may be able to deliver at a much higher rate on an ongoing basis. And if you're going for lowest price, like that's a that's a terminal game. Um, okay. The, the last one, um, to the extent you can talk, you guys just bought a business, mm-hmm. which again is like classic, uh, how I think of y'all, you bought a, <laughs> amusement uh, ride manufacturing, mac- manufacturing business. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously it was a willing seller. Y'all did like what, ha- can we talk to the extent of how did you decide well, this is a business that we want to buy? Because you just mentioned selective search, uh, executives finding yeah. love. We've talked about a government marketing business. Yeah. We've talked about a pool manufacturer. Yeah. And now we're building amusement parks. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, all of these yeses it are probably... It feels pro- erratic when you say it that way. It does. It's not erratic. But that, but- <laughs> so that's my point. All of these yeses to businesses are still coming out of a similar process that you go through. Yes. Yeah. So, 
Um, so in this, so Chance Rides is the name of the company. It's been around since 1961. Um, and uh, Gen 2 and Gen 3 were actively involved in the business as we got to know it. So um, uh, respecting their privacy, the, the intention was to keep it a family-held business long-term. That was the intention up until uh, the late 2010s. Okay. And so Gen 2 was getting older and he had decided he was ready to take steps back. Um, and his son stepped in and had been involved in the business for years, but became CEO and he started to take steps back. Um, unfortunately, the son passed away. So um, it was it was structurally not what they had prepared for, not what they understood to be what they were trying to achieve in the process. And, um, and so it... That, that was hard, right? For a whole host of reasons, that was hard. It wasn't the plan. Um, but they had done a tremendous amount of work uh, following on to that where um, Mr. Chance had stepped back in um, and uh, another son had gotten involved in the business as well and they were going to continue to steward it forward. But they knew that they were no longer going to optimize for the business being owned by family long-term. The business has their family name on the door um, and it's in Wichita, like it's, you know, everybody knows everybody. So, um, they started to recruit a management team. They spent four years recruiting that management team. We started getting to know the business about 12 to 18 months ago. Okay. And, um, by that point, their management team was intact and they were looking for the right type of partner who would appreciate the thoughtfulness that went into who they selected to operate the business long term, um, who would appreciate the heritage of the business and the fact that their family name is on the door um, and would provide for the opportunity for the business to grow over time. And so those were the things that they were looking for. And that became clear very early on. So you know, back to the very first part of our conversation. I mean, pretty early on, I saw the deal, um, saw the dynamics, and and there were a lot of value proposition why reasons why I liked it. I mean, it's high price point, high margin work, um, but they had a variety of different product categories, had showed the ability to change their product offering portfolio along with like market sentiment um, for types of rides and all that type of stuff. Um, and uh, and from the standpoint of they did look to have a scaled management team, so which is important in that business because that business is uh, stewarded as a CEO by an engineer, and it should be. <laughs> we don't want to ride roller coasters <laughs> yeah. by people who are not engineers. Um, and so, with that in mind, uh, we said <laughs> let's let's see if we can have that conversation and if that makes sense. And so that's what led to getting to know the chances and having that conversation. And honestly, like that was a, um, it, it, it's, it's a really cool brand. And like, I, I underappreciated even how much love for that company exists in their own industry. So it, it because in this case, because of some of the stuff that had happened with the family, uh, they had issued, decided they wanted to issue a press release. We typically don't issue press releases about our investments, but they wanted to, and uh, they wanted the industry to know the decision that they had made, um, that they had a partner and that the business had a, a very um, promising path forward. So with that in mind, that's how um, the press release came about. And in response to that, we got a lot of inbound contacts from people in their industry saying, you're the lucky ones. Like, you guys got lucky. This is an amazing company. And for us, that so was cool. such a compliment. Like, it was so cool. It was like, it was one of those things that were like, yeah, we think so too. You know, <laughs> it was, uh, but it just came full circle. But, um, but yeah, it was a, a situation that very much hinged on um, establishing trust with the family that, you know, the, the decisions that they were sort of forced to make um, and that hadn't been their plan, like being sensitive to that and making a plan together that protected for all the reasons why the business was as great as it is. Um, and as you know, the industry appreciates was very much a collaborative effort. And I just um, I want to um, how, how do I phrase the question? Can you maybe share with me five or ten, maybe a, a string of questions you would have asked that group early on 
it's not the same that you could ask everybody about where, you, you know, who's the owner, how long have you had it, but yeah. nuance to the industry. Again, I'm assuming <laughs> building amusement park rides wasn't something you sure. were versed in. So what would be a series of questions you might start asking to understand the business? So I think it started um, primarily with the decision making process. So who asks whom to bid? Like, are they propositioning customers or customers coming to them okay. saying this is what we're looking for? And in that vein, do how much of the scale and the um, intricate nature of what they do, right? How much of that is predetermined by the customer? How much are they responsible for originating? Because that gets to sort of like the subjective creativity that has to exist within the team versus the engineering talent that has to exist within the team. And then looking at that based on product category. Um, then you're looking at like the pattern of, uh, it, depending on how long those decisions take to be made, then what's the frequency with which people are buying and then looking at the bid to close ratio on that, right? So just what's their general success rate? How much do, how much work do they have to do preemptively to win work? How, you know, how much can they forecast all of those things? Um, then talking about execution, trying to figure out, um, what they are responsible for, what they sort of get other input or other technology or IP for, um, so as you can imagine, there are a lot of people working on ride technology, ride oriented technology around the world. A lot of it can be licensed. So what do they own? What do they license? What are the licensing arrangements? How does all of that work? Right. Then you get into, um, specifically because they work with, you know, the major theme park operators, you can also get into character licensing. So how does that work and what are you capable of and what are you not capable of? And why would someone choose you or why would somebody choose a lower cost competitor? What are the outcomes associated with that? Um, and that gets to, you know, again, from a creativity standpoint, what kind of fine artists do they have to employ? What does an apprenticeship program look like there? Um, they have an entire paint shop. So understanding sort of like the nuance of that, um, what they do on site, what has to be validated by their customer and when things ultimately come together. Um, then talking about com uh, competitive forces. So for them, you know, you have raw materials that are coming out of metals. Like how does that factor into pricing and to execution? What do they preemptively buy? How does cash flow through the organization in order to do that? So these are like all operational vein questions yeah. that you kind of get into that's specific to their industry. Then talking about the international dynamics. So they sell internationally. Great opportunity set for them. There are trend lines within the industry that suggest there are additional product categories that they want to get into. Um, and this is where like I get on every call with an owner and just say like, Pretend like I'm 10 years old and you're explaining what this industry looks like and why you're positioned where you are. So they have things that they anchor on based on their heritage, right? They were known for carousels for decades. They did all of the um, rides that could move around with carnivals, but they have developed capabilities over the last 20 years in roller coasters and in Ferris wheels, like the big giant wheels and those types of things and then people movers as well. So as all of these things have developed, what are the things you haven't gotten to and why? Why did you prioritize those things? And it starts to translate into a conversation that changes from operations into judgment. And so, you know, who made those decisions? Why did you make those decisions? Why did you avoid doing, you know, other things that are on your wish list, right? Why hasn't that made sense yet? Um, and then figuring out from there, based on who makes decisions, what's healthy about that? What do they think can be improved upon? What resources would be helpful in order to continue to build their success story? Um, and it, it all anchors on the idea that like, uh, because we are involved in so many disparate industries, they have to know their positioning. We, are, we cannot be responsible for saying this should be your position. Mm -hmm. So they better understand what the competitive forces are, where they can win, where they can't, um, and sort of on a game theory basis, like you want to play games, you can win, right? Yeah. So talking with people about like, how do you think you can win and what does winning look like? And how do you think about what's required that you have or don't have? Because um, sometimes it's harnessing existing talent and capabilities in different ways. 
and repackaging. And sometimes it's building additional capability or capacity, yep. um, but just talking through all those dynamics. So ultimately we get kind of all the way around to going back to like what excites you about this brand and this company remaining independent. Because if you don't care, then we are not a good buyer. Yeah. Because <laughs> we intend for it to be an independent brand for like 30 years. So <laughs> at least. Um, and so in that way, it was a conversation around, okay, where does that lead to? And and in and it's like if you were to ask me, if I was to uh if if uh, I was to ask you questions about real estate and you were giving answers, yeah, I'm in real estate, I know they're good answers. Yeah. How do you know that the answer they're giving you is a it's a good answer. You don't have other amusement park manufacturing mm-hmm. businesses to benchmark that against. So are you then taking answers, talking amongst the team? Mm-hmm. Is there an advisor that like, how do you know you've been given a good answer by something you know nothing about? That's a fair question. I think that um, as uh, this harks back to journalism, but like I often ask a question like three different ways. Yep. Um, and if the answers aren't congruent, then I'm following up on why. Why did you say this and this? Like, don't those things Interesting. like combat each other in some way. Yep. So there's the in the room conflict that you try and suss out and figure out if you if you can get a clear picture. Um, and then, I mean, we definitely do external research, right? And just right. try to understand um, the market dynamics and look at, you know, who are the players that they mentioned versus who are the players that regularly show up in news related to the industry? What are the latest innovations that are being touted in the industry? How well do those relate to those? And then um, looking at, you know, uh, this is not specific to them, but like in some industries, you can see pace of bidding, um, sort of macro structure of like volume of spending and all of that kind of stuff. And just look for, I mean, honestly, a lot of times what we're looking for more than anything is not like the macro trends of the category as much as it is like pricing structure and understanding where they fall on the pricing structure. So are they at the higher end? Are they ahead of or behind the pricing trends? Um, and how does that shake out in terms of the work that they win? Yep. Um, and kind of going forward from there. So it's a lot of different things, but I, I would say that we, <laughs> I'm not shy about like looking dumb. Yeah. I'm fine looking dumb. And I'll ask the question three different ways. I'll ask it on two different phone calls. I'll ask it again in person. And we'll just keep trying to figure it out and make sure we understand it. And if we don't understand it, we also want to know. So sometimes we'll end the conversation by saying, um, this is what I think I understand. <laughs> did I did I understand that correctly? Right. Um, if someone's being disingenuous about sort of like momentum and whatnot, which does happen. I had something recently that somebody was like, look, we're scaled. I've talked to a bunch of private equity firms. I've turned down offers, um, but maybe you're the one. And um, And that, again, goes back to like, I will nerd out with somebody, but I won't flirt with somebody. And I was just like, great. Like, I would love to see it. And then I'll let you know what that looks like. Um, But they were definitely looking for like us to pitch them and us to like flirt with them. Right. And then I got the numbers and the numbers just didn't match the story. Like the scale of the story, sort of the position that they felt like they were in. Um, And, uh, you know, our, our take is like the situation matters more than anything, but the numbers do matter. Um, especially when you're talking about investing millions of dollars. So they do have to be in balance with each other at some level to make sure that we're talking about the same set of facts. Like shared reality is a huge component of what we're trying to get to. So when people talk about momentum or they talk about projections, we're more than happy to talk through all of that stuff. But we want to get to a point where we understand what you're assuming about the future to achieve that, how that differs from how operations currently act, right? Who makes decisions? Where does the money come from? How much are you reinvesting? Like all of that. And then it's more of a, okay, what has to shift in order for these things to come true? And is that something that you're willing to participate in the risk on or not? And and that's like just shared reality, right? So we talk to people all the time, like there are probably 20 different ways we can make an offer on any one situation, at least. And a lot of it is, do we understand a shared reality? And what are we willing to share in terms of risk allocation within that? Okay. Um, We've kind of sequenced, we're kind of sequencing. So we've kind of talked about just seller mentality, diligence, why we like businesses. I'm going to kind of skip over we've made a deal or we've come to terms. Yeah. 
And then I'm going to go to some words we talked about, transaction tensions. Mm -hmm. So just because we've agreed on price, you see how I'm I'm like a business that I'm selling to you? (laughs) Just because we've agreed on price and terms, the deal's not done. No. Can you just speak to what you said, transaction tensions? What do you mean by that? What are things, what other things happen irrespective of the industry, irrespective of the financials, just like human behavior that can make these things more complicated as they move forward? Well, um, so we, I think the easiest way to answer this is from the very beginning, you're trying to build a business deal. Mm-hmm. So there's there's a legal deal, there's a financial deal, but those are underpinnings to a business deal. And for the purposes of selling something that is going to continue, it all has to be based in what is the business deal, right? So I think a wide variety of tension arises when you think you're doing something for the business, but it's really for your personal benefit. Mm. And that leads to Example. a lot of friction, right? So you say that you um, that the the entire operation is uh, transferable, that you need to stay for two years, maybe in an advisory capacity. But looking at operations, that is that is very far from reality as it exists right now. And uh, but for your own purposes, that's what you need to do, right? So. That changes, though, the risk profile of the business deal, Mm. if that's what you need to do. And you can have very good reasons why you need to do that. Um, And so the tension between those two things is something that we like to be transparent about and just talk through. Mm -hmm. Um, And some people have different levels of comfort. And obviously, there's like there's a trust factor in whether you're willing to reveal to somebody like, look, I made a promise to my wife and I have to sell, period. And, and I totally respect that. But if we don't know that and you keep saying like the business will be fine, you don't need me. No, that's not true. Right. right? But let's work off the same set of facts and then we can figure it out. Um, so there's that element of it that creates tension. I also think that people get um, get excited about the financial elements of it and don't realize that like <laughs> it sounds it sounds kind of flippant in in abstract, but you know, you get millions of dollars and then you wake up the next day and you like that was your identity. And now you have millions of dollars to offset for your identity. Um, But if you're not continuing forward with the business or if you materially feel not great about the decision, that's going to negatively affect you in ways that don't have anything to do with money and in very meaningful ways. Right. Um, And we've seen this mostly in deals we haven't done, but sellers who we've kept in contact with long term. And seller's remorse is very real um, and it affects people differently. I mean, you know, on a broad level, we all know like the person who retired and started aging rapidly Mm -hmm. post-retirement. And that type, type of circumstance is still applicable when you're an owner and you are passionate about your business. Um, and so those sorts of things, as you're like getting closer to doing a deal, that type of tension can come out. Um, and then another example is, uh, so you've got the business deal and the personal deal. Um, if you've done other deals, those can also get kind of messy, right? So if you've done a sale lease back on your building, that can be really complicated if that liability involves personal guarantee, a long-term lease, and is not uh, negotiable going forward. And you don't want to have any liability in that going forward because that is a long-term liability on the business um, that you have obligated it for um, in ways that a buyer is going to have to adapt to. Um, So there's all different types of like tension that comes in, but really what we try to try to always anchor from is we're trying to understand what the business deal needs to be and what you're trying to solve for And then we can figure out based on that how to solve for all these other things. But you're not going to win on every issue, right? Like, And if you want to win on every issue, then you're going to only select a certain type of buyer set. And you're ultimately probably not going to be happy with what that buyer set does, right? Um, You know, it's sort of like if if you have no options, then you attract sharks. If you uh, demand things you attract people who are willing to accept your demands. Um, And sometimes you're not going to like what they do either. So it's all kind of a selection bias and trying to figure out 
what are you willing to compromise for in the name of getting the best overall um, plan for for the company and for you? Um, and then I would say, like from a general tension standpoint, I think that people um, they build it up in their heads as being this major event, and then a lot of it is lawyers talking to each other, you're signing some documents, and then there is like our hope is that there is no meaningful change, um, at least not initially. And everything that is changed over time is sort of organically what is better for the business anyway. Um, And sometimes people are looking for the event and that can be off-putting as you're getting closer to it if you sort of are waiting for that and it doesn't happen in a material way. What comes to mind is like college graduation. You think it's this yeah. long drawn out process and it's like college ends and the next day <laughs> you're like, go to work. It's go to work. Or it's like, it is yeah. not this process. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know y'all aren't psychologists by any means, but is there anything, <laughs> even with the most, um, what we would call like a seller that just checks all the boxes, we get to closing. Like, is there something that sell, like, do they go take a week long vacation after close or do you literally just say like show up the next morning like it never yeah, happened? Yeah, I mean, uh, we we are very much of the mindset that we're trying to make it a non-event. Yeah. Um, and but we'll participate in things that they think should be an event. So sometimes they want to announce to the whole team and like have a party, and like we're happy to participate in that. But we are not going to say we're going to throw a party or we're going to show up at the office and we want to meet everybody. Yeah. It doesn't need to be that. Yeah. Um, and uh, but I would say on average, like. The cool part is most of the transactions that we do are partnerships mm-hmm. um, where people are rolling forward and staying actively involved in the business and believe in the future of the business. When those things are the case, typically they're hungry to start doing stuff and to start getting to work on those activities. So on, oftentimes they're the ones like, okay, can we get on a call? Can we start talking about this? You know, like they're ready to get the ball rolling a little bit faster, yep. which is a really cool sign to see. It's great. Um all right, we'll, we'll we'll finish on just kind of two topics. This has been incredible. One is um, you said long term employees and why the Twitter hype around independence and self reliance annoys you. <laughs> okay, so this is the list that I delivered to you when I said, okay, I I will go back on not doing a podcast interview because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I did I did initially say no, and part of it is. Um, part of it's Brent's really good at it. Mark's really good at it. That that seems like enough. Um, but to the extent that the one of the things that I was thinking about is I am I am an employee. I'm now I I'm I'm a part of the GP commitment now. But for a very long time, I was an employee of a company, um, and a lot of the SMB investing real estate, Twitter, like all of that stuff, which I follow and really enjoy and respect everyone that takes part in, um, there is a very heavy vein of you shouldn't work for anybody ever. Yeah. And um, and I think that that has a lot of negative consequences, both in terms of the people that work for those people yep. and the perception of their value as a result of saying that publicly. Couldn't right? agree more. And then, um, and just uh, and just understanding like what should my aspiration be, right? Because if you're saying that publicly, then I should, as soon as possible, jump ship, right? So Brent and I have worked together now for 15 years. Um, I've never heard Brent say something close to that publicly, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I've heard him say like he doesn't think he would be a very good employee. He's also said, I'm not a particularly good employee, right? (laughs) So like the characteristics of what make a good employee and why you ultimately end up working together can be very broad ranging. But I think there's an appreciation for like doing the work together and having people that you can maintain loyalty with and maintain partnership with long term really is meaningful. Um, And that shared experience and the institutional knowledge and the trust that you build over that time I would argue is invaluable um, compared to constantly having people roll through your organization that you're just delegating work to. So I think that people are missing that um, in that narrative, right? I think that it's very much focused on what they think their personality traits are uh, best oriented for. And I think it's on optimizing for, you know, financial and prestige outcomes, which I can appreciate, but I think it's just, it depends on what you want to do, right? 
I, I know that I do not have the risk tolerance to go start a firm on my own, right? Nor would I want to because I enjoy being part of a team. Yep. And if, if you're going to build a great team, you have to value the team. And if I would give Brent credit, Brent gets credit for a lot of things, but I think his under credit, undervalued for that specifically, like he has invested heavily in valuing the rest of the team and trying to make sure that he gives people room to be able to do what they do with excellence um, and to not get in their way. And at the same time, to respect them for being part of the team that he ultimately owns the majority of, but that is a place that they want to stay, right? right? So I think it's just a topic that, you know, as people think about building their firms, um, because a lot of the people that I think are on these platforms are, you know, in earlier stages, right? And I think you can run through a lot of people. Um, but if you're the single source of institutional knowledge for the organization, that is problematic in a whole host of ways that you probably underappreciate at that point in the journey. And everything we just talked about, this entire, every great business is a consortium of employees, a founder, Absolutely. a team. None of these things get built without the team. Absolutely. And I think that's like gets lost on people. And that it gets othered in a way that it's, like it's, isn't healthy. It isn't, it's, it isn't helpful. And I think that um, to the extent that like there are lots of reasons that people can get a W-2 as people <laughs> and still be meaningful contributors to a business and still have an ownership mentality. And I would put the onus on individual owners yep. to make sure that the incentives are aligned for them to be able to do that. I'm going on the record saying I agree with you 1000%. <laughs> um, none of these companies exist without quote unquote W-2 or employees. And just like you said, Thinking like an owner and acting like an owner is a culture. It's a set of incentives. It's not um, some made believe thing. And right. so I think a lot of the folks maybe that say this are, it's really more an indicative of how many bad companies there are out there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I maybe don't want to pass not, judgment. Maybe it's right? not bad, but just people that are fed up with where they're at or. Right. Well, and I think a lot of people who ultimately go independent probably did have a, a work experience that culturally was negative, right, yeah. in some way, and didn't allow for them to feel like they were capable of their full potential within that environment. I totally believe that that can be the case, especially inside larger organizations, yep. right? So there can be reasons why you would want to be entrepreneurial and go do your own thing. It doesn't mean that you should discount the vast majority of the workforce that helps you to do that. Have you ever watched that um, TED Talk on Super Chickens? You have to no. watch it. It's fascinating. So okay. basically they did a study and they it was it, they literally um, it was like a group of chickens and there was like one leader, they, like a certain type of chicken that was clear the leader and everybody else was this team of chickens, just yeah. regular chickens. And they worked together and they provided they made they um, they birthed the, the most healthy uh, new chickens. They laid more eggs than everybody. Yep. It was just this like beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. And then they took what was the leader, mm -hmm. that type of chicken, and they built a family of just what they called super chickens. Mm. And, and, and like three years later, it was like, where had they progressed? And virtually like all the super chickens were dead. Yep. They like weren't producing young, their eggs sucked. Yep. And it was just this reminder of you, you think it's easy to maybe go on in reference back to like uh, content or what might right. generate some likes. It sounds really good in theory or it might generate a lot of uh, interest or controversy. But in practicality, like you are doomed to create a culture that is self-destructive. Well, it feels like uh, contrarian in a way that is popular Correct. contrarian, yeah. <laughs> which is counter yeah paradoxical. But that actually reminds me of a book and I'm going to forget the name at the moment, but I read it last year that is very much focused on what sustainable, what has been sustainable in nature over time is far more oriented with cooperation, not competitiveness, right? right? Because it is ultimately like, and they take a lot of animal examples and explain that we focus on the ferocity that exists within the circle of life and in the natural world. But really, oftentimes the ultimate winners are the ones that were somehow cooperative and contributing to the broader environment in a way that benefited more 
you know, more nutrition, <laughs> better habitats, um, and strength in, in numbers, right, within their community. So not killing each other as being like the central component of that. Um, and it was a very interesting read in that same vein, which is like, you don't want to other or turn the enemy to be someone that you are supposed to be working closely with. Yeah, you... And you your words matter as an owner. Yeah, I mean, if you tie it back to the household, uh, which many people, may, my, my listeners might be married, like you, you can't imagine how well a marriage could go with a husband and a wife that are competing against each other every day. Right. Like, oh my gosh. Yes. It is the name of the game is cooperation Correct. at some level. Correct. It's you're in the game of life together. For sure. And that <laughs> extends not. out. Yes. All right. We'll bring it home on. Um, this has been such a great conversation. Uh, something we had talked about, which is just women and in investing in general. Mm -hmm. um, it's a male dominated kind of industry to, to some extent. Yep. But maybe my first question is, do you think there's a perspective that you bring to it just as a woman that maybe men don't have because of how we're built and raised and think about the world? I, I think that because I am a woman, I focus less on what men uh, contribute to the situation and more what I know to be true as a woman in my own experience, okay. if that makes sense. Yeah. So I think that um, it is not super helpful to focus on like any sort of mentality that says the system is against you. Yep. No matter who you are. For sure. Um, and so in that way, like maybe there are points of education that could be helpful. I think there's been massive improvement over the years and people's awareness generally and willingness to help support people who are exploring alternative career opportunities. Um, and I think that men and women and people of color and, you know, anyone has yeah. contributed to, right? So like I, it, that to me is not the, the cornerstone of why I stay focused on the issue. I see um, it generally the biggest, there. there's kind of like the people around women and then women. Women, from what I've seen, choose predictable paths. And I think that this is something that is contributed to by the people around them. So um, when, like like we talked about earlier, I got a lot of advice from very well-intentioned, very smart people early in my career who said, hey, you seem ambitious, you seem capable, you need to go back to B-School because you need that in your portfolio to continue to build your career. Um, and and so I sort of explored why, right? So, you know, there's the network benefit of who who you get to know as part of going to B-School. Yep. There's some sort of credential associated with the institution that you go to. Um, and then you have different opportunity prospects in terms of scale um, in, the, in the industry out, uh, once you leave, right? So that's the general idea. But all of that is sort of centered around the idea of having a more predictable path more predictable career. Low risk. And if I look at the career advice for women and women's natural inclination, as we see it when we talk to, you know, undergrad classes like seniors, as well as people in B-School, yep. the natural tendency is most women are going for the more predictable path. And I think there are lots of reasons why that may be the right decision, but it shouldn't be based on your gender. It should be based on your personality and the way that you're trying to optimize your life with your career being a component of life, right? Yep. So there's no right or wrong answer to it. If yep. you want the predictable path, that's totally fine, right? But I don't think it should be the default. And I think that most career advice specifically for women is that that should be the default because people are trying to protect them from, you know, having a bad outcome, right, yep. is essentially what it means. But again, you can't have an outsized outcome if you go for the predictable path on average. Mm -hmm. So with that, I think that it starts early. The other thing is that trust, in my experience, is built over a very long period of time. And it's harder to build trust as you grow older um, in ways that would allow for you to enter an organization at a senior level capacity if you are of another gender. So what I've seen be most successful is when women start to get to know someone um, early in their career where people can be helpful in ways that don't necess necessarily translate into them getting into judgment-oriented roles. Down the line, 
they may end up in judgment-oriented roles with those people. If you don't know someone, and I don't know why this is, but the pattern that I have noticed over the years is that it is harder to build that trust when you're both now in a senior capacity and you're you're deciding for judgment and you're of different genders. Mm. So um, I see this a lot with like women who follow the predictable per- career path in banking and then want to tra- transfer into the buy side. And they get frustrated because they don't have the relationships. They didn't build them when they were young. So they are cold in terms of getting to know people and they may be interviewed. They may be considered, it sounds bad, but like for the token hire, mm-hmm. but it's not going to be the judgment decision that mm-hmm. they're going to be looking at at that person for. Because in all honesty, there are lots of ways that people form relationships, right? right. And when you're forming relationships between guys, like you can do that in a variety of different capacities that as you get older and people have families and all that, it's weirder to do, right? Yep. On average. So to me, it's like, what I see women often doing too early in their careers is staying focused on um, the next job and and relationships for the next opportunity and not thinking about what their network could look like 10 to 15 years down the road. Um, and that translates, translates into just limiting how you can build trust when you're trying to do so in sort of a judgment-oriented capacity. So this is why if you look at statistically, because you said like, in investing, women um, make up a, roughly half of entry level employees. Okay, so it's not bad anymore. Yeah. Like it's, and if you look on most teams, you're going to see some women. Yeah, they're usually going to be at the bottom. Yeah, <laughs> in uh, in more entry level or administrative roles, right? Um, as you go up in judgment value on average, so if you get to investment committee level, right, in in all sizes of private equity going up to big private equity, only 9% are women. Mm. So that's the trust like falling out in the career path. Mm. And if you look at who does make it in a um, C-suite capacity, often it's a chief risk officer, chief compliance officer, or, ch- or chief financial officer. It's a predictable, predictable path that you can build on record as being objectively trustworthy, right? So if you're going to be subjectively trustworthy, like taste on deals, ability to negotiate, like all those things, those are things that establish are only established through a very long track record of trust. Um, and in my opinion, that starts by forming relationships really early. I think for you know men in obviously hiring and judgment level capacity, it's just an acknowledgement that like you should get to know women it, with the idea that it may be years before you have an appropriate opportunity for them. But to the extent that if you find somebody who's sharp, like invest into getting to know them, right? Because it may be with you or it may be that you can transfer trust on their behalf. But the biggest issue is that, you know, if they don't work on establishing that network earlier, it's not going to get better as oh. they get more senior in their career. All right, then I guess I saved the deepest question for the end. Uh, I have a daughter, six, and I have a daughter that'll be four this weekend. You have a beautiful daughter. Mm-hmm. You've clearly thought a lot about this. We've talked about maybe things we're, we're starting to tell women later in their career. Is there a certain set of principles or things that are important to you that you are starting to teach your daughter now so that maybe she is a little less risk averse down the road? Yeah, I imagine you deal with this too. But for me, I mean, part of it is um, she doesn't naturally have a lot of adversity in her life. Yep. So trying to figure out how to um, present adversity in a way that builds character mm-hmm. um, without doing so in a false way, right? So uh, later this week, I'm picking her up from camp. She's been at camp for two weeks. She's seven. Um, that's a fair that's amount adversity. of independence yeah. <laughs> for a seven-year-old, right? Um, and she's had to you know, manage her own trunk and um, you know, her own hygiene and a bunch of stuff in doing that and establish her own relationships, get to know people. Um, that's the type of thing that I think is age appropriate right now. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, reading for us has been um, a consistent component of what we've done since she was a baby. Um, but now there's a lot more reflections on reading. So like, what did you take away from that? Like, what characters were you drawn to? What are the underlying themes that you're paying attention to? Because it's really interesting to see their personalities develop. And I'm sure you're seeing this as well. But like, 
she's attracted to certain characters and to certain ideas and to certain genres. And you're like, okay, so why is that? Like, what is it? <laughs> and you start to appreciate, like, what are the trend lines? Um, and then like, we, we definitely optimized for instead of specialization, like a very broad range of experiences. Yep. Um, so she's traveled, like we take her places all over the world, um, with the intent that it's not supposed to be like, that she has her favorite foods, um, but that she's going to experience other cultures and appreciate them. Um, and that also <laughs> extends to uh, like her activity set. So we are not a traveling soccer family or like a traveling anything family at this stage of her life. Instead, it's like, go try this, go try that, go try that. Um, she has it in her head that she's going to be a three-letter agency agent. And so her view on all of that is that um, all those skills are going to be helpful to her. She becomes a spy, yep. um, <laughs> which I feel like is a very appropriate seven-year-old answer. Yeah, um, It has been her answer for about two years, actually. So maybe it happens. But to the extent that like those are the types of things that I think matter at this stage is like just giving her the confidence that she's capable of doing things, having adversity that teaches her skill sets that we think can benefit her over time, and giving her a broad range of experiences off of which to develop preference. Emily, this was better than I could have expected. <laughs> I have so much I respect so. I feel for like you. It, it was like dinner. Like I, I can't figure out when I'm supposed to stop talking. Or I could I keep <laughs> the truth is I could keep this going for two more hours if it was totally up to me. Um, I don't. I, yeah, mm, it's probably good to cut us off. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.